you. Good evening, Word of God. Can we stand together as we reverence the reading of His Word? Are you blessed to be in the assembly this evening? Can you give the Lord a hand clap offering? He is good. If you have your Bibles, if you would, turn with me to 1 John. 1 John chapter number 4. 1 John chapter number 4. And if you would, we're going to look at it over in verse number 4. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 4, as we pick up part 3 this evening of ancient spirits and modern culture. Boy, we had a time in here last Wednesday night. And I'm looking forward to seeing what the Lord's going to do in this service. I don't know about you, but I needed every word of worship and needed that encounter with the Lord tonight. And I'm grateful for healing. Amen. Mental, physical, spiritual, all of the above, right? First John chapter number four. When you get over there, just say amen. amen. Hallelujah. So we have uh, on our live stream, we, we have various hosts each week that kind of mediate the, uh, the live stream and they answer questions and give information and repost scripture and that kind of thing. And tonight, I believe our live stream host is Miss Kim. Is that correct? Somebody that knows is not to head at me. I think, that's, I think that's the case. But either way, whether she's our live stream host or not, she is our member care director here at Word of God Ministries. She oversees so many facets of this ministry. She is one of the most amazing individuals that you will ever meet in life. Um, she is the coordinator of our life uh, uh, March event that would be taking place this coming Saturday. She's just an amazing woman. If you know who I'm talking about, her name's Kim Banks, and today is her birthday. So can we just give it up for Miss Kim? We love you. She's one of those individuals that's so impactful, makes such a difference, but you don't always see her. Now, she was on the video just a few moments ago on the Around Word of God video. We call that AWOG. She was there, but just a beautiful, beautiful person. And Miss Kim, we love you and pray that this day has been blessed and that this be the best year of your life. Amen. First John chapter number four, when you get over there, just say amen. All right, verse number four. Verse number four. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Matter of fact, let's do this. Let, let's, let's go back and just read this verse out loud together uh, from, from 1 John chapter number four, all right? <clears throat> Ready? Read. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I just felt like that ought to be our opening verse as we enter this study tonight, not because of what the topic is, but just because of all the warfare that's going on around us. We have to remind ourselves, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Can you just say that out loud? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I, I, I want to encourage you that if you haven't already, make that one of those verses that you just have memorized. And that no matter what your day looks like or what you're going through, you just declare it out loud. Say it again. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the ministry gift of your Holy Spirit. And I pray right now, Father, for all who would be under the sound of my voice at this very moment, for those here in this assembly, for those that are watching this live stream, I ask your blessing on our hearing. Lord, I pray for those that are assembled in our Bozier campus and those gathered here, God, that you would just do something supernatural in this atmosphere. And God, we thank you that your word never returns void and that by the spirit, Lord, that you have sent the spirit of truth, that you would lead us into truth, that you would open the hearts of every person under the sound of my voice, that we would receive revelation knowledge, that we'd receive wisdom that, Lord, we receive conviction of truth, words of hope, faith, and salvation. I ask now, Father, that you would speak through me words that you would have spoken, that your Holy Spirit would speak by me, that your word would be on my tongue, and that you would make my tongue the pen of a ready, alert, and sensitive writer, that I could write on the hearts and minds of these, your people, your anointed word, 
removing their burdens and destroying their yokes forever. As we boldly declare that, Satan is defeated. We are redeemed, and Jesus is Lord. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Will you clap your hands for Jesus? Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, this is just the service for announcements, and we celebrate Miss Kim's birthday. Also, we have two staff members here at Word of God that just got back from their honeymoon. Two staff members that got married now. Is there something written about that that you work at the same ministry and then mess around and get married? Well, it happens. So if I'm going to get them, both of them, to, these newlyweds to stand up, Braxton and Leah, would you guys stand? Welcome back. <laughs> Happily married couple. Yeah. We love you guys. And I apologize later for embarrassing you, all right? That's what happens when you get married and go on honeymoon and come to a midweek service. You've got to really love Jesus. I wasn't expecting you guys back till Sunday. I looked over, I said, man, they, they, they love each other and they love the Lord. That marriage is blessed, amen? If you would, turn over with me. We read before the prayer in 1 John 4, but turn over with me to chapter 5 of 1 John. Chapter 5 of 1 John. And I want to look down at, uh, at, 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 at verse number 3. So we're in part 3 of ancient spirits in modern culture, and we really began to dig in last week to idolatry, idolatry, and what are we putting before God? And I'm going to show you here in a minute in the Word, we're going to go back to Exodus chapter 20, where the Bible talks about putting something else before God. I don't know how much thought you've given this to life, but the what we do should always be motivated by why. And when we're questioned about the what's we do, what are you doing, there needs to be a why. When, and, and, and when it comes to every what we do, there needs to be a why that is the fuel to the what. And there are all of these things that God's word tells us to do, and he tells us what to do. But what's beautiful about the word of God is that when you dig into it and you find the heart of God, you're able to see the why behind the what. And I want to show you the why here in 1 John chapter number 5 to some of the what's that God has called us to do in his word. So we'll start here in 1 John 5 verse number 3. Notice this. He says, um, and we'll read verses 1 through 3, all right? He says, whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begot loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Now let's just stop right there and reread that part out loud, Shreveport and Bozier. Ready? Read. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Now read the last part. And his commandments are not grievous. If you would, if you're one that writes in your Bibles, I would underline that final statement. And his commandments are not grievous. And his commandments are not grievous. If you would, quote that out loud. And his commandments are not grievous. Now, with that in mind, if you would, come back with me to the Old Testament. And I want to go to Exodus chapter number 20. The book of Exodus chapter number 20. So God says, my commandments are not grievous. And so we're getting ready to read in Exodus chapter 20, where one of the commandments of God is that we have no other God before him, that we put nothing else in front of him. Nothing else comes before the Lord. But why is that? Why would God in his word tell us to worship nothing else before him and to put nothing else before him? Does God have an ego? Is he, uh, you know, uh, egotistical? Is, is, is he... Is he conceited and, and absorbed with himself, which is that word defined? Is he self-centered? Every commandment of God is without grief. Every commandment of God is given for our benefit, which means no person is ever going to honor all the commandments of God and see that break them down or do them damage mentally, physically, spiritually, or financially. You can't honor God and not be better for it. The commandment of God is for our own benefit. 
His commandments are for our benefit. And a part of trusting God and honoring God is believing that there is a why behind every what that he tells me to do. There's a motive behind that and that he is not just God, not just my father, but he is the creator and he has set things in order that when I honor his order, it is best for my life. Now that might be hard to think of when it comes to what we put before God, but I'm gonna show you in his word that it is absolutely the why behind the what. So we'll look at it in Exodus chapter 20, if you're there, say amen. And we'll start in verse number one. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Read verse three out loud with me. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. One more time. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now I want us to be real with, 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 with ourselves. Not necessarily real with everybody in the room, you know, I'm not asking anybody to stand up and confess all the things they put before God. But I really and sincerely want us to challenge ourselves in this message. And if, whether, whether or not this challenge takes place in this service or this is something you're going to take home and meditate on, whether this is something that's going to go into your, 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 your prayer tonight or first thing in the morning or later in the week. But I'm hopeful that we're going to carry this genuine conviction and ask ourselves, is there something in my life that I've made my God, that I have made my idol, something that I have placed before him. And there's so many idols of today that we need to recognize, things that we've made idols, things that we have idolized that are not God, which reminds me of some of our uh, fe uh, key verses in this series and what I've called feature verses. And one of those is Isaiah 45, 20, where God says, assemble yourselves and come Draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations, that have no knowledge, that set up the wood of their graven image, and pray unto a God that cannot save, and pray to a God that cannot save. That's Isaiah 45, verse 20. Have I put something in my life as a God? Have I made something in my life, an idol? a thing of worship, but it can't save me. It's not brought health to my life. It's not brought restoration to my life. It's not completed me mentally, physically, spiritually. It's not brought all the things that it said it would bring. It's left me empty. It's left me wanting. It's left me wanting. Jeremiah chapter 16 is another key verse in the series. Jeremiah 16 verse 20. Well, the Bible says, shall a man make gods unto himself that are no gods? Shall a man make gods unto himself that are no gods? And the last key verse in this series that I want to repeat again is 1 John chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. It says, and we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are him that is true, even his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And then he ends with this, verse 21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols, amen. Keep yourselves from idols, amen. I think it's easy to read God's word and see all these idols that were made by these foreign nations, uh, the, these Canaanite nations, and, and say, well, I don't have an idol in my house. I don't have anything in my house that I worship, nothing sitting on my mantle or in my living room that I worship as an idol. Matter of fact, I've only seen one emblem of worship, and it was many years ago when I first got in ministry, and this guy came banging on the church doors where I was serving in a pastoral role but was not the pastor. Teenage boy banging on the door. I stepped out, opened the door, and he with this deep voice said, I'm possessed. I said, no, you're not. He said, I'm possessed. I said, no, you're not. Possessed people don't knock on church doors, not during the day legally. <laughs> and so... He came in and I, I got the chance to minister to him and he lived like two blocks down with his grandmother and I ended up praying with him and went down to his house and in his bedroom, he had set up this skull and some of these other things where he prayed every night to Satan and, and he told me that he couldn't be saved because he'd already given his soul to Satan. I said, no, Satan does not have your soul because he couldn't afford it. 
Because Leviticus chapter 17 tells us that the life of the soul, and the, the, that, that, that life is in the blood, and God set the price tag on my life in innocent blood, and only Jesus could afford me because he's the only one that spilt his blood to save me. And so when I let him know that he might have thought he sold his soul to the devil, but the devil could not afford him, and that he could give his life to Jesus, and he did. He prayed, and, and his, his grandfather was out in the backyard with his big 55 gallon drum, you know, burning trash like we used to do back in the day. And man, we took all that stuff that he had hanging on his walls and took that skull and we threw it in that fire and the flame didn't change colors. Now, I ain't gonna make this dramatic, all right? It burned like everything else burned. I wish I could tell you that some kind of, you know, crazy smoke thing did not. Nothing dramatic, it just burned up. And then that Sunday we baptized him and he had become a believer because he turned his life to Jesus. Now, I, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm like uh, 18, 17, 18, just turned 18 years old. And I asked him, what kind of God has Satan been? You know, what, what, what was your life like? He was depressed. He hated himself. He, 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 he brought self-injury to himself. He had crazy thoughts about doing people that he loved harmed. The point I'm making is, is that even though in his mind he had made Satan his God, Satan made a bad God. I don't know about you, but things that I put before God in my life, when I look back at those things, they made a bad God. They did not bring health to my life. They did not bring peace to my life. They did not bring salvation to my life. And I'm here to tell you that if you will ever make the one true living God your God. If you will ever call on the name of Jesus, you will look back across your life and say, Jesus, you have been a good Lord. You have been a good God. You've saved me from myself. You've saved me from my enemies. You've saved me from my sin. And every time I did it your way, there was peace and there was wholeness mentally, physically, and spiritually. He's a good God. He's a good God. But anything that we put before him has a way of bringing destruction and pain and chaos and confusion. My point is, is that when God says, put nothing else before me as God, he's saying that as the one true and living God, not because he has an ego and needs my worship. He don't need my worship. He's God without my worship. I don't make him God. Now, he makes me who I am, but I don't make him who he is. He is the one true living God, and he doesn't owe anybody anything. He's God all by himself. He's God without any church. He's God without any preacher. He's God without any believer. He's God because he's God. He stands in need of nothing. He has no rival. He has no equal. He is God. He has no ego because he has nothing to be jealous of or to compete with. He owns everything. He created everything. He is above everything. Everything started with him and everything ends with him. So he doesn't need an ego and he has no ego. So when he says to me, put nothing before me, James, it's not because he has an ego problem and needs my undivided attention. He knows that once I put something else in front of him, then I'm on a road to destruction. Then I'm on a road to death. Then I'm on a road to confusion and chaos. He knows that whatever we make God is no God and will make a bad God and bring no health or life into our existence. So, if, you know, if you want to just briefly think of things in your own life that you've made God and that you've idolized, what did it bring you? What did it give you at the end of the day? What benefit do you have in having surrendered your life over to those things? Now, I want to uh, continue in what we started looking at last week. And we, 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 we looked at this golden calf that the children of Israel had made to be God and, and, and how they worshiped it. And they gave that golden calf the credit for their own deliverance their own salvation out of Egypt. And I want to go back and just take another, another look at that. So if you would, turn back over there with me to, to uh, Exodus, the book of Exodus, and we'll go to the 32nd chapter. What's my calf? What's my idol? What have I put before God in my life? And if you're having a hard time with coming up with something, you won't have a hard time here in a minute because I'm going to list some things. So just stay with me, all right? Stay tuned, all right? And this is not a message 
you know, of condemnation. This is a message of salvation. This is a message that hopefully will cause us to examine ourselves and, and be honest and be real. Uh, whatever I'm putting before God in my life is setting me up for failure. It's setting me up for destruction. It's setting my family up for failure. So we'll look at it in Exodus chapter number 32. If you're there, say amen. Verse number one, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. Now, it had been 40 days that he went up in that mount. And they got impatient. They said, well, we need a god. So they gathered up earrings and from the ears of their wives and, and, and sons and daughters and all the wealth that they had. And verse 4 says, And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool, and he made a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now, you know that's a lie. Wealth didn't bring them out of Egypt. Now, they came out of Egypt with wealth, but wealth is not what did it. Now, if you're watching this on YouTube, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to part two of this series because we're bad about doing the same thing. Before we jump on these Israelites and say, how could they think about your own life? You know, we read last week in Deuteronomy 8 where God said, how is it that once you get wealth and build the nice house and your belly's full and you've been eating good, then all of a sudden then you say, my hands and the might of my power got me this. And, it, and, 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 and listen, it's so important that as God prospers our lives that we don't stop giving him the credit. You, you can't let the Lord take you from nothing and, and, and bless your life and prosper you. And then you say, well, you know, that's what hard work would do. That's what a good education would do. That's what commitment would do. That's what getting up early and staying up late would do. Wait a minute. Hold on a minute. There are a lot of folks do all that and don't have what you have. Can we just give the Lord the credit for that? Can you just honor God in this? So what the children of Israel did, we read it, that they came out of Egypt. Psalms 105, 37, 38 says that there wasn't one feeble person. None of them were weak. And that there wasn't one... A uh, 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 sick person among them and the Bible says they left with Egypt silver and gold and great wealth so they came out with a caravan of wealth when they left Egypt many people overlook this because we know we've been programmed by that movie the Ten Commandments and we thought everybody came out of Egypt broke busted and disgusted laid up on you know couches and, and, and hung over on crutches but that is not the way they came out God supernaturally healed them and prospered them and they left with Egypt's wealth and cattle and linens and everything that they would need to survive in the wilderness. And, and, and they, they head out. And then what do they do? They take that abundance of wealth that they had. I mean, they couldn't spend it. There was no super Walmart down the road. And so they end up melting it, making a calf of gold. And then they worshiped it and said, this is what got us out. Before we're critical of the Israelites, we need to ask ourselves, do I worship my money? Do I worship my money? Do I worship my savings account? Do I worship what the, the wealth I have in my life? And do I give my ability to obtain it, the credit for where I am right now? Or do I honor God? Because wealth is something easily, uh, uh, something easy that we see here that we put before God. Money's not the root of all evil. It, it's loving money that is the root of all evil. Go back and listen to last week's message. We dealt with this. And so they're given now this, this picture of wealth, the credit for what brought them out. And this God of wealth, a part of worshiping this God of wealth, was they got, they got wicked. So we, rose, we read in verse number six, and they rose up early on the morning uh, on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. So this was some immoral activity that was going on here and the Lord spoke unto Moses and said, go get thee down for thy people which thou brought us out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. See, money is an amplifier. Whatever it is that you want in your life, whatever it is that you're passionate about in your life, money will amplify that thing, which means money itself is neither good nor bad. It just amplifies who I already am, which means if you like to drink, the, uh, more money will help you drink more. Are you hearing me? 
If you like to eat, more money will help you eat better. Okay? It, so all money does is amplify an existing habit. And so there were, there were things that were corrupt in the children of Israel that that money just amplified. And then worshiping this golden calf just amplified. Think about it that in your own life. What, what have I allowed money to amplify in my life? What have I allowed uh, my prosperity to amplify in my life? What would be amplified in my life if I could afford it? Mm, that's a heavy question. All right? So... With, with, with this in mind, I want to come over to the New Testament, the book of Colossians, and I want to go to the third chapter, the book of Colossians, chapter number three. Colossians, chapter number three. So there was more to it than just the worship of money when they built that golden calf. When they rose up to play, that was immorality. There, 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 there were some sins happening in the camp. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Matter of fact, at one point, they didn't have any clothes on. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? All right, so it, there was wickedness that went on. And matter of fact, it was so wicked that, that God said, that's it, I'm gonna destroy them right here. And Moses prayed on behalf of the children of Israel to God. You can read it in that 32nd chapter of Exodus. And, the Lord, and, and, and Moses said, wait a minute, Lord. You promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob a seed. You promised them that you would bring his seed out of bondage. You promised them the, the promised land and all these things. You, 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 you can't change now. And the Bible says the Lord changed his mind. Now, I don't believe he ever was going to do it. But it, 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 it demonstrated Moses' faith in God and in the promise of God as the leader of the children of Israel in the wilderness. And God spared them because of his covenant and his promise. But watch this in Colossians chapter 3, verse number 1. If you're there, say amen. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. As I was writing down some modern day uh, uh, idols, I couldn't help but think about these three words. And these just popped in my mind and I wrote them down. Uh, what do I invest in? Who am I, what am I affectionate about? And what do I defend? Those three things came to my mind. Where's my investment? Where's my affection? And what do I defend or who do I defend? Because typically, if you look at what you're invested in, if you look at what you are affectionate about, and if you look at what you defend, you've just demonstrated what's most important to you in your life. And so think about that, you know, in, in a positive light as a parent. Who am I invested in? Well, I'm invested in my family, in my wife, my children. Well, where's my affection? Well, my affection's for my wife and my children. Well, who will you defend at all costs? I will defend my wife and my children, my family. So, so you think about when you're, when you're invested, you're all in. When I'm affectionate, I'm all in. When I would defend this, I'm all in. And at, when, when you think about what you've put before God or what is dishonorable in your life, have I allowed something to take my affection away from my spouse, away from my children, away from God, away from his word? Has my investment followed my affection? Because the Bible says that where your heart is, that's where your treasure is, which means you can't separate what, you, what you're affectionate about from your treasure. You will put your money on the things that you are affectionate about. There's this connection there. And so, if you really want to know what you idolize or what's most important in your life, follow the money. Mm, Y'all were quiet there. Let me find something else to say. So, investment, where's my investment? Affection, where's my affection? And what do I defend? So, you know, you know, last week we had an attack on our church. And what did we see Sunday? Not only in Shreveport, but in Bossier. In our Bozier campus, in two services Sunday, we ran out of seats. They were in overflow, and then we ran out of parking. So even in Bozier, Word of God, you know, members and, and visitors showed up, and we saw record numbers here Sunday that we haven't seen since before COVID. What, what I interpreted that as, oh, you attacked our church? Well, guess what? We are invested in Word of God. We are affectionate about what the Lord is doing here, and we will defend it. Glory to God. So when, when, you, when you look at those three things, it helps demonstrate what's important to me in my life. But an idol and these things that I put before God, my affection 
my investment and my defense can tell on me. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes, but I wanna read here from Colossians chapter three. So he says, if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Uh, so he's talking about affection. Where am I putting my affection? Is my affection on Christ? Is my love on Christ? Where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Here it is in verse two. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Read that with me out loud, Shreveport Bossier. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. But how many times have we set our affection on worldly things and it's taken away from the things of God? Our investment has shifted from the things of God to the things of the world. Our affection has shifted from the things of God to the things of the world. That's idolatry. I'm not talking about a man loving his spouse or a, 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 a wife loving her husband or loving your children. I'm not talking about these honorable things that God has called us to do. I'm talking about when I've allowed something in my life that has not been ordained by God and I've made it my focus and I put it as my number one. Something else is losing in my life because of the investment and the affection that I'm placing in on this thing. Something else that's honorable is losing because of what I've prioritized in my life. He says, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Mortify. Mortify means to kill, crucify. Therefore, your members, your, 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 that's your, your flesh, which are upon the earth. Now, I want you to notice a few words here. The first one he lists is fornication. Fornication. What is fornication? It's unlawful sexual activity. So it, 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 is, it, is, it, is, it is being engaged in a sexual nature that, that's outside of the, the honor of marriage. It's not necessarily adultery because adultery is when you're married and you're unfaithful. Fornication is you're not, you don't necessarily have to be married to commit fornication. If you're single and you're in the bed with somebody, that's fornication. Okay. <laughs> Uncleanliness. Inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Now, this is heavy, but it's going to be heavy sometimes, all right? I can't, I ain't not no coochie coochie coo preacher. If the word says it, we're going to teach it. I didn't write it, I'm just sharing it. But if you look at the list of things that he says we need to get rid of, things that we need to mortify, things that we need to crucify, he begins the list with fornication and he ends the list with idolatry. He begins the list with fornication and he ends the list with idolatry with the statement that covetousness is idolatry. That covetousness is idolatry. Now, there is a biblical connection between these three words. Oh, it's going to be heavy. I've been knowing all day it was going to be heavy. You don't sit here this long. You might as well hear the end, all right? There's a biblical connection between these three words. Covetousness, idolatry, and fornication. All right? There's this connection between them. If we read carefully the text in Exodus 32, you see it. Because they were doing more than just worshiping the gold. All right? They had corrupted themselves. And so there, there is, there, there's, this, there's this connection between covetousness and strange flesh. Now, think about this. When you look at the word covetousness, I like to study the Bible by saying, okay, where is that first mentioned? Where do I see covetousness in the Bible first mentioned? Well, I can give you an answer to that. It's first mentioned in the commandment of God when God tells us in his word in the book of Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, put this in your notes, Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, the first time we see it in the commandment of God, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. I can stop right there. And then he goes on and ends and says, don't covet anything that your neighbor has. So notice the list begins with his house. It includes his wife, 
or anything that your neighbor has, even if your neighbor has a business and has employees, don't covet your neighbor's employees. Churches, quit calling Word of God or quit sneaking around trying to hire Word of God staff members. Don't be coveting what belongs to another ministry. Amen. You violate the commandment of God when you do that. Be honorable. Amen. That needs to be said. I'm glad I just said it. I'm not going to do that to you. Amen. So coveting means I go after uh, my neighbor's house. I see what he has, I want it. Biblically, he said, don't be coveting your neighbor's spouse. Hello. That means get your eyes off another man's wife. Get your eyes off another woman's husband. Get your eyes off that man's daughter. Amen. See, my girls aren't married yet. You understand what I'm saying to you? So I don't, don't let that day come. All right? they, 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 they're under age right now, but don't let, don't let that day come. But don't be unfaithful. Don't, don't have this inordinate affection, this unlawful affection toward what you have no authority over, what you have no rights to, which, to that which is dishonorable. And the, the point I'm trying to make here is that there's this connection between idolatry, covetousness, and immorality, sexuality, fornication, and our world is plagued with it. You can't even escape it. It's all around us. We're plagued with this whole, this whole filth and mess that our society is just constantly pouring into our eyes and ears. And we as the body of Christ, he said, wait a minute now, th th this is ungodly. This is something I'm supposed to set before my eyes and my ears and, and, and recognize it for what it is. Now, let me read that same verse, verse 5, from the Amplified Classic Bible, the Amplified Classic. It says, so, so kill, deaden, deprive of power the evil desire lurking in your members, those animal impulses, and all that is earthly in you that is employed in sin. Sexual vice, impurity, sensual appetites, unholy desires, and all greed and covetousness, for that is idolatry, the defying of self and other created things instead of God. What have I put before God in my life? Let's come over to the book of Ephesians, turn back a couple of chapters. Everybody still good? All right, go, go back with me to Ephesians 5, and let's look at verse number 5. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to have some good news here in a minute, all right? And, 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 and listen, we need conviction. We need to be reminded that our God is holy, and that there's a reason why he's saying we need to avoid these things. And young men, you got to think about it like this. You can marry one day a Proverbs 7 woman, or you can marry a Proverbs 31 woman. And I encourage you to marry a Proverbs 31 woman. If you don't know the difference, go read. All right? I don't have time to break all that down for you now. I gave you the whole chapters to study. And, 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 and ladies, you know, what kind, of, what kind of wife, what kind of woman you want to be? Read, read Proverbs 7 and, and read Proverbs 31. And you say, well, what about the men? Well, I got a word for you too, the whole book of Proverbs. So you just read the whole book. <laughs> All right, and listen to the word, the words of a wise man to his son. All right, so in, in, in chapter four, chapter five, all, all this whole book. All right, but watch this in Ephesians five. I give the ladies two chapters, and the man got to read the whole book. Amen. All right, we're responsible. Ephesians five, verse number five. When you get there, say amen. amen. He says this: For this you know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord." Walk 
as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. That's why I've been trying to find every kind of word I can use to explain to you this mess because the word's saying right here, it's a shame to even talk about it. And, and God is saying in his word to, 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 to reprove those things, get those things out of your life. So notice verse number five, he, he, he again connects covetousness, whoremongering with idolatry. There's this connection between the two, or three. Let me give you another verse for your notes. As you turn to Galatians, turn uh, back one book to Galatians 5. But let me give you a verse for your notes. It's Revelation 2.14. It says, but I have a few things against thee. This was Jesus. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So Jesus in Revelation 2.14 connects idolatry with fornication, sexual sins. Now, I don't expect nobody to be shouting right now, all right? We're good. Well, watch this in Galatians 5, verse number 19. And let me read this one here, and we're going to go back to Psalms. You're going to see why I brought all this up. Stay with me. Galatians 5, verse number 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. That's sin without restraint. That's an addiction. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, which is a drunken party, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall, it, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, which is self-control, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another and envying one another. Now, let's go back to the book of Psalms, and I want to go to the seventh division. So I've shown you in Ephesians 5, Galatians 5, Revelation 2, and in Colossians 3, this connection between sensuality, our flesh, covetousness with idolatry. What I'm hoping that does is bring idolatry into a modern culture and see how idolatry is just as real today as it was things we read about in Scripture. It's taken on a different face. It's taken on a new look, but it's still the same sin. It's still the same acts, except we live in a culture today where it's celebrated. Now, watch this in Psalms. I want to go to the seventh division. Psalm 7. Now, remember what I told you at the start. God's commandments are not grievous. So when he says, don't put anything in front of me, it's not because he has an ego and can't take our uh, affection and investment and defense somewhere else. My investment in the things of God does, does not make him God. My affection toward Jesus doesn't make him more Lord. And my defense of him is not needed. I, God don't need a defense system. He defends himself. He's God. He don't need a defense system. He's God. So there's nothing that I bring to this relationship that makes him any more God than he already is. But when I put something in my life in front of him that is no God, 
That God does not bring salvation. That, that, that idol, that thing I put in my life brings deterioration. It brings sin. It brings destruction. It brings corruption. It destroys my marriage. It destroys my home. It destroys my finances. It destroys my future. It destroys my career. It destroys my life because that thing was never meant to be God. So watch this in Psalms, and I want to go to the seventh division. And we'll look at it in verse number 14. Now, you're, you're, you, you know, you might be thinking, but man, I, I, don't, I, I don't call this thing God. But do you put it before God? And just think about those three words. Where's your investment? Where's your affection? And what do you defend? And sadly, there are Christians that name themselves Christians that invest in the world, are affectionate about things of the world, and defend the things of the world, and, and don't have that same kind of allegiance toward God. That is idolatry. So, so watch this in, in uh, wherever it was I told you to go. Psalms, Psalm 7. All right, watch this. Psalm 7. We're going, let, me, let me look at my note. Y'all don't get me confused now. Did I give anybody a verse? 7, 7, 14. Hallelujah. Thank you. Mr. Heron's on the front row. He got it right. I'm going to listen to him. All right, here we go. Verse number 14, Psalm 7. Behold, he travaileth with iniquity and hath conceived mischief and brought forth falsehood. Travail means I'm in pain. Travail means I'm hurting. And what's interesting about travail, and, and when you look into the word, it's literally defining a birth pain. Now, I'm no mother, but my wife is of four, and I was there for all four. And travail is a birth pain that at the beginning, is th those pains are further apart and less intense. But the closer you get to the birth, the closer they are and the more intense they are up until the birth. That's the birth pain. Now, he says, behold, he travaileth with iniquity. What does this mean? Iniquity, which is sin that has become a part of my very nature. That's the only difference between sin and iniquity. You can commit a sin and feel immediate conviction. And say, oh, I can't believe I did that. Lord, please forgive me. Iniquity is that same sin that you stop repenting of. You made it a part of your life, and it became iniquity. Iniquity is that sin that I'm callous toward. I don't feel convicted about it. I think that it's okay. I've allowed it into the fabric of my life. And he's saying here that, that iniquity uh, uh, it, it, it leads to, verse 14, Behold, he travaileth with iniquity. What does that mean? That means iniquity in my life will cause these birth pains to begin to happen. There's something in wrong in my life. I'm having pains, and these things are becoming more frequent, and they're becoming more severe, and the result of that is iniquity. Verse 15, he made a pit and digged it. So there's a pit in my life that I dug. I brought this on myself, and it's fallen into the ditch which he made. Now, notice he's saying, your iniquity is leading to your travail. Your iniquity, your sin that you allow to become a, fabric, a part of the fabric of your life is it, like a birth pain, and it's leading to something very severe and something destructive and intense in your life. And what saddens me is that so many times we look at what's going on on social media and, and, and what, 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 you know, uh, 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 Hollywood wants to put out, and they want to applaud unlawful and ungodly activity and applaud all these things, but they don't tell you the end story. We have this push toward our children of, 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 of telling them that, that, that maybe they're not the, the gender they were born in. And, and, and we, we want to celebrate the person that looks so good being what he's not. 
But we don't talk about those teens that have taken their lives. We don't talk about the other side of those that say, wow, I've messed up my life. How do I reverse what's been done in me? It's like those, those testimonials don't get any exposure. They don't get any attention. You, you, you hear this applaud and this push toward a woman's right to choose all the way up until the date of birth. And, and, and it's applauded and celebrated. But you don't hear the story of those that have gone through the pain of, of, of forfeiting their child and and terminating their pregnancy. It's like, whoa, we don't want to hear that. Don't let us, don't let us hear the end of the story. You hear, you know, and it's glamorized, the unfaithfulness and the infidelity of a man toward his wife and that he found his true love. But you don't get the backstory and what it did to the marriage and what it did to the home and what it did to the children. My point is, is that when sin runs its course, it always brings death. When sin runs its course, it always brings destruction. But that side is never amplified. It's not told. That story is not heard. We only get the front end. And what God is saying in Psalms is that these things that you've made iniquity in your life, you have set yourself onto a pain that's only going to intensify with time if you don't repent, if you don't turn from it. He says you've dug a, you, you have a pit that you've dug and you're falling into a ditch you made. His mischief shall return upon his own head. Read that out loud. His mischief shall return upon his own head. In other words, this thing that I allowed in my life, this thing that I never repented of, this thing that I put before the will and word of God has come back on me. His mischief shall return upon his own head. See, this is what folk don't want to talk about. This is, what, this is what, what sadly preachers don't want to deal with. Is that the wages of sin is death. And even though Jesus died so I could have eternal life, if I choose to live in sin, if I choose to live consistently putting things before God, that thing is going to come back and bite me. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. You cannot get away with slipping in the booth, in the back, in the dark, putting something before your eyes, sowing something in your heart, and think that it's just going to stay there and that nobody's going to know. No, because that thing is a seed that you're planting in the dark. That thing is a seed you're planting in your bedroom alone that you don't realize is going to come up to a harvest and now you can't control your eyes and now you can't control your affection and now you've lost your marriage and now you've ruined another marriage and now your home is broken up. Why? Because of what you did not, uh, did not do, what you allowed to come into your life that you put before God. That thing has become a bad God to you. When I allow things that are not of God in my life and I, and I put my investment in them and I give them my affection and then when, I'm, when, when they're dealt with, I defend them. What kind of God are they? And the Lord has shown me here in his word that these things that I put before him, these sins that I won't repent of, will turn back on me. Now, there is good news. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that good news is, is Jesus has the power to break the back of the enemy in your life. And Jesus has the power to break the spirit of lust. And Jesus has the power to liberate you from fornication and covetousness. And Jesus has the power to break every idol in your life. He has the power to come in and wreak havoc on everything that you made God in your life and give you a new life. Corinthians 5, 17 says, I'm a new creation in Christ. And old things have passed away. And all things have become new. And he can renew my spirit and renew my mind and renew my affection. He can renew every aspect of my life. He is the only one who has the power to change me from the inside out so that these things that I have placed in my life don't become my God and don't, and don't pronounce my future. Amen. He has that power. So let's, let, let's look at that power, all right? And then we're going to close, all right? Go with me to 1 Corinthians 2. Told you we're going to end on the good news. 1 Corinthians 2. Idols of today. And we'll, we'll pick this up more next week. 
Identity. Identity is an idol of today. We'll break all these down in further detail next week, maybe even the coming weeks. I was watching a, a, a game the other, the other day, and the commentator was talking about a, a, a previous player of the game many years ago. And he said, you know, the difference between this guy, and he was contrasting it with players of today, is he said he was a team player, and he played for the team. He said so many today play for their own brand. People want to become a brand. They want to become an idol. Identity can be an idol. Your appearance can be an idol. Money and things can become idols. Status and titles can become idols. Influence and fame can become an idol. A, a, a key word for our society today is an influencer. Look at people on social media and call them influencers. If you gain that status, then you're idolized. She's an influencer. He's an influencer. Comfort is an idol. It's amazing what faith and truth people will sell out for the sake of comfort. Sex has become an idol. Always has been. We saw that all the way back in Exodus 32. Things that we put before God. Things that we invest in things that we are affectionate toward, and things that we will defend. So here's some questions you can ask yourself, and I'm almost done. We're going to look at a couple of scriptures, get some good news, and get out of here. Glory to God. I mean, not like we need to get out of here, but not, you understand. We have to go put this word into practice. Get home so we can repent. <laughs> All right, what are my idols? Here's questions you can ask yourself. Question number one, where do I spend my time? Where do I spend my time? Where do I spend my money? Where do I get my joy? Here's a heavy one. What do I refuse to question? What do I refuse to question? See, true believers that know Jesus and his voice and his word, they honor his word. And it's like, I'm going to do what, Lord, let me do what you called me to do. And I was reading a, a verse in Psalms the other day. I, I, I can't remember which verse, it, which, which Psalm it was, but it's where David, it, it, he starts that Psalm questioning God. But you, you, you discover about midway through that psalm, he's, he's, he's already changed his, his tone toward God. And, and, and uh, he begins to speak of how he's going to praise God. Um, I, can't remember this, I can't remember the psalm. I'll, I'll see if I can find it for next week. But it's like even those moments when we question the Lord, when we pray and we seek his word and seek his face, and he's so compassionate and merciful, he begins to give us the answer and we praise him still. It's as if whatever's God in your life, you won't question it. And there are things that our society is pushing now that people won't even question. It's like a politician can say something and it'd be ridiculous and violate everything you know in the word of God, but because you're Lord of that party, all of a sudden now you don't question it. It's like whatever they say becomes law. And because you're Lord of that party, now, oh, there's nothing wrong with it. Oh, there's nothing wrong with it. You don't question it because it's your, it's your God. What you don't question in your life is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, is a, a sure way to look at what do I idolize. You don't even want it questioned. You don't want anybody else questioning what you idolize. And then the last one, whichever number I'm on, five, what's always on my mind? So number one, where do I spend my time? Number two, where do I spend my money? Number three, where do I get my joy? Number four, what do I refuse to question? And number five, what's always on my mind? And in light of that questioning, watch 1 Corinthians 2, 16. He says, for who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind 
of Christ, which means for a believer in Christ, there's no questioning of his lordship and his power and his salvation in our life. Glory to God. And that's what aggravates so many kingdoms of darkness in this world is that you can't get a Christian to deny Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So many times it's not that the enemy can't get us to worship something else. It's that he can't get us to stop worshiping Jesus. So even if you put something else in your life that you have idolized and you feel convicted right now, if Jesus is Lord of your life, you got power over that idol. You got power over that thing that you've even put before God. Why? Because he is God. Hallelujah. And the enemy ultimately doesn't just, he's not going to be satisfied with me just worshiping something besides Christ. He wants my worship to be turned from Christ. Last verse I want to read so you can see freedom is John chapter 8. This is the good news we're going to end on, all right? John chapter number 8. Jesus to give you power to liberate you from whatever you made an idol in your life. See, going back to that first verse we read in 1 John 5, 3, that God's commandments are not grievous. Let's just do this real quick. I'm, I'm going to read this and we'll be done. Think about the idols you've had in your life and the negative consequences. Think about the idols you've had in your life and the side effects. It's almost like one of them medicine commercials. If you take this pill, you know, you're going to get this. And then they said that's slow. And then in high speed, they listed the 85 side effects. And you're like, man, I can lose my sight, my hearing, my taste, life. I think I just deal with the headache, you know. So idolatry has side effects. And it has negative consequences that we never talk about. But the thing is, is God knows those negative side effects. And so he says, hey, don't put that before me. Because of what it's going to do to you. Not because I, I'm, an, I, I, I'm a God with a big ego and I can't take that you put something in front of me. No, I know what that's going to lead to. So how many, how, many, how many people go to bed every night with anxiety of what other people think about them? Well, that's, what's, that's what worshiping your identity will do. I can't wait for next week. I'm going to wrap this up. I wasn't made. I wasn't made. God didn't make us to be an idol. We don't know how to handle worship. We don't know how to handle that kind of attention. Listen to me. I can't be God. There are things that only God can handle. And when I try to put myself in the place of God, it will break me down because I am not capable. I am not capable of doing this. This is putting me out of my league. It's like taking a little two-seater uh, two sports coop and putting a hitch on it to pull your tractor around town. You might get down the block, but you're going to burn the transmission up because it wasn't made to carry that kind of weight. It's like driving your Lexus in the Cross Lake. It's going to sink. You're going to ruin a nice car because you put it in a place where it didn't belong. When we put things in our life that don't belong there, it only brings destruction. And God is trying to save us from that destruction by saying, hey, don't, don't make these things God in your life. They make bad gods. You, you talk about one of those items we listed is comfort. Think about the people, the, the things that people will sell out just to be comfortable. So we won't stand up for truth. We won't stand up for what's right because that might take us out of our comfort zone. Because this is uncomfortable for me to preach this kind of message. So, you know, I'm, I, I was all day just in mental warfare. I told my wife, I've been struggling all day. Nobody want to hear about what I'm preaching? I mean, I know you do, but, it, you know, like, this is, this is counterculture. This isn't no sugarcoat, make everybody feel good about our mess. No, th th this is real stuff that's all around us. We're, our society is plagued with it. My 
Now, I could really go off right now. I'm stopping. That's it. John 8. John 8. And, you know, when we do something God tells us not to do and our body starts breaking down, the world likes to come in and say, oh, here's a pill you can take. I got to medicate my disobedience. I never had to medicate myself after worshiping him. I never had to medicate myself for doing what his word told me to do. I never had to go get an injection because of what his word told me to do. My point I'm trying to make is, is that when we get other things in our life and we make that God, then all of a sudden we have all these side effects we got to go get help for. Because they made bad gods. All right, John 8, amen, I'm there. Here we go, are you there? Verse 30, as he spake these words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciplined ones indeed. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. I need the word of God. And I need, to, I need to make a decision to continue in the word of God. So that my life is disciplined to the word of God. And as I discipline my life to the word of God. I'm going to become one with, know intimately the truth. And the truth of his word will make me free. Now, what am I being made free from? Because they begin to question Jesus. What do you mean made free? And then Jesus said this in verse 34. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abides not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So I had somebody years ago tell me, all these things I couldn't do because I was a Christian. Well, you can't do this. You can't do that. You can't do this. You can't cuss. You can't lie. You can't do this. Oh, actually, I can. I can do anything that sin will allow me to do. Any believer can do anything sin will allow you to do. But when I was in my sin, and before I knew Jesus, I couldn't be the me I am now. Because I didn't have the power to lay my idols down. I didn't have the power to turn from my ways. I didn't have the power to give up things that were in my life. But Jesus, when I called on his name, saved me. He delivered me. He liberated me. And yeah, I can do what the next guy can do. But you can't do what I do because I can't even do what I do without him that is in me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. It is he that has given me power to live the life you see. Jesus breaks these idols in my life. Hallelujah. And so Jesus said, whom the Son makes free is free indeed. And what kind of freedom is he talking about? He's talking about being free from being the servant or being enslaved to sin. Because sin makes a bad God. So let's bow our heads in prayer. And I want you to ask yourself as we pray. What am I invested in? What am I affectionate about? And what do I defend? Sincerely, let's have a sincere altar call right now. Let's sincerely seek God with these three questions. What am I invested in? If you had to pull out your credit card statement, your bank statement right now, what would it show you're invested in? Where's your money going? Where's your affection? Where do you, where is your affection? Where, where, what do you love? What do you long for? And if someone dare touch it or bring it up, what do you defend? You can follow those three words and find your idols. Investment is time. Investment is money. Investment is service. I'm invested in this. I invest my time. I invest my finances. I invest my service. I'm invested. 
I'm affectionate. I'm passionate. I long for, I desire this thing. And I will defend it. Even if it's, even if it's wrong, I'll defend it. And I was in a study today and the Lord gave me those three things. What have we put in our life before God? He's God until those other things show up. He's God until you put something else out there. Let's renounce right now what we've put before him. Let's renounce right now what we've put before him because there are no gods at all. Our ego, our titles, our positions, our name. Oh, man, man, man. Subtly, I mean, it is so subtle. If the enemy in our mind, this is a word for somebody. If the enemy in our mind, I'm going to pause and I'm going to say this and I hope you hear me. If the enemy in our minds can convince us that God has not been a good God, it's then he tempts us to choose another God. That thing can be your appetite the thing you lust for, the thing you desire, your new passion, it has your affection. And with your affection comes your investment. Your money follows it, your time follows it, your service follows it. If anyone dare call it out, you defend it, you excuse it, you justify it because it's been your idol. But how did it become your idol? It became your idol when the enemy convinced you that your God had not been a good God. That's why when we're depressed, that's why when we're discouraged, that's why when we feel like we're having a bad day, guess what we want to do? We want to go indulge our flesh. We want to go eat something we don't need to eat this late, and we want to eat a lot of it. And we want to indulge ourselves on TV or on social media, and we start pouring things in that satisfy the flesh. Why? Because the enemy has convinced us, you've not had a good day. He's not been a good God. Let me give you another God. And if you think that's not biblical, read Luke chapter 4. After 40 days of fasting and prayer, Jesus came down off that mount, and the enemy knew he was weak, and the enemy knew this was the hardest point in his life up to the cross. And what does the enemy do? He says, you know what? If you really are the Son of God, make these stones bread. You need to indulge. You need to eat. You need to satisfy your flesh after all that you've been through. And what did the enemy say bow down and worship me I'll give you all this world has to offer when did the enemy come when Jesus had, had 40 days of prayer and fasting the hardest days of his life up to the cross the enemy will come at you the same way when you've had a rough time a rough season in your life a rough day that's when he comes in and he says indulge indulge just indulge do something for you indulge turn to something else and let it be your God. And you know what? We look back and we find ourselves addicted and we find ourselves in bondage. We find ourselves broken and discouraged because of what we allowed in our life because they're no gods at all. They're no gods at all. They didn't bring peace. They didn't bring joy. That one night stand didn't bring you wholeness. That one night stand didn't deliver you. It only made you feel broken and shamed. And, and in that moment of brokenness, what did you want to do? You wanted to go do it again so that you could just drown out that message, that drink, that night of drunkenness. It didn't make the marriage whole. It didn't change your finances. But, but the brokenness that it brought led you to believe that you needed to go do it again just to drown out the voices. These things are bad gods. And I'm called on you right now to turn to the one true living God and he can make you free he can make me free he can make us free from every bondage and every addiction and anything that we would ever indulge in that we would make God that is no God at all 
And I'm telling you that Jesus loves you and he will conquer your idols and he will be the one true living God in your life and he will bring you freedom and there'll be no side effects, no negative consequences when you give your life to Jesus. I invite you to pray. I invite, I invite you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, search my heart. Show me where is my affection? Where is my investment? And what do I defend? Help me to see the things I put in my life that have become my idols. And they're no God at all. They come with side effects. And they don't save. But I turn to you right now. And I believe you love me. That you are the one true living God. That you sent your son Jesus to die for my sins, to die for my idolatry. And I believe you raised him from the dead. And that in his name, I can be free. I can be saved. And that I can walk in newness of life. So I confess, Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of my life and declare according to your word whom the Son makes free is free indeed. I am free indeed. In Jesus' name, I am free indeed. And I receive this freedom by faith and declare that I am a new creation in Christ Jesus, all things are passed away. All things have become brand new. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Can we rejoice right now? Glory to God. <laughs> on both campuses, let's stand together. If you need prayer for any reason, on both of our campuses, we have men and women of faith down front ready to pray with you. You just come down front and someone will pray with you. Listen, I want to encourage you to be a part of our march uh, uh, this coming Saturday. It'll begin at the Louisiana Boardwalk on the Bossier side of the river, 10 a.m. Let's march across that bridge. Let's do it for life. I hope to see you there, 10 a.m. That's when it starts. I believe I am right about that, looking for somebody to confirm. That is right. Miss Lee is telling me. 10 a.m., Saturday morning, Louisiana Boardwalk, Bossier side. See you there. On that word, you are dismissed. All right, if you need prayer, come forward. Otherwise, I love you. Have a blessed week.